The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to today's Chemistry World webinar. Uh, this is in association with the Royal Society of Chemistry's Enterprise Plus. Uh, so today's webinar, as I'm sure all of you already know, uh, is about the biocidal products regulation and supply chain obligations. Uh, and this is our speaker today is uh, from the Consultancy for Environmental and Human Toxicology and Risk, and Risk Assessment. It's Sarah Kirkham, who's a senior consultant there. Um, and she has been dealing with the biocidal products regulation and biocidal products directive before that since about 2000. So she's extremely uh, uh, experienced and knowledgeable and hopefully she'll be able to uh, uh, fill you in on all of the details of everything you need to know. Uh, during the course of the webinar, uh, please do feel free to ask questions. If you look in the go to webinar uh, panel, the sort of dashboard that you can see, there's a questions tab there. If you type into that, then we'll be able to see your questions um, and we'll be able to ask them uh, to Sarah either during the uh, 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 webinar itself or at the end. And we will have a plenty of time for a question and answer session at the end. Um, we will be sharing the slides from Sarah's presentation with you at the end of the webinar through the handouts function on that same de uh, same dashboard. So uh, I'll remind you of this at the end, but do look out when I say that um, that we'll we'll be sharing the slides with you there, and you should be able to download them and keep them. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sarah to uh, complete the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Philip, for that introduction. Um, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the RSC for inviting me to talk to you today about the biocidal products regulation and how it will affect those that are making and using biocidal products. I've already received a few questions prior to the webinar, and I have tried to answer some of these in the presentation, but I know I won't be able to answer everything. So uh, I look forward to your questions later. Okay, the biocidal products regulation covers both active substance approval and the marketing of authorized biocidal products. And this can make the regulation very complex with certain requirements, which some of you are probably um, not interested in and they have no relevance to you. So really today I'm just going to concentrate on those aspects which will primarily affect those people who are just dealing with the biocidal products themselves. Uh, these are authorization of the biocidal product. We're going to look at treated articles, biocidal product families, in situ generated active substances in the systems that they're generated from, and comparative assessment. Okay, so the biocidal products regulation has actually been in application since the 1st of September 2013, and this was a year after it was actually published. It replaced the Biocidal Products Directive, which had then been running for over 14 years, and the regulation and the directive itself was considered to have many serious drawbacks, and the new regulation was actually supposed to correct these. One of the major features of the new regulation was a change in how we defined a biocidal product, and this made it more inclusive. So the burden of proof for people now lies in actually showing that a product is excluded rather than included. It means that several active substances like in situ generated substances and substances that can work by an indirect means by which I mean they indirectly impact on the normal functioning or life cycle of an organism, which can be, for example, by removing elements essential for growth or reproduction. These must now be included in the review program. The change in the definition also means that substances such as food or feedstuffs that were previously exempt can now be classed as an active substance, especially if they are specifically marketed as attractants. And these are normally included in things like traps, insect traps. 
There is a list of food and feedstuffs that have been identified by industry as potential active substances and that's just recently been published by the Commission. So the regulation actually now places the burden of complying firmly on industry and it follows the example that was set on REACH. But with this, we have new measures designed to try and help applicants, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, that might never have actually encountered regulatory and compliance before. And these are the items that I really want to briefly touch on today. Okay, I'm going to look at authorization first as this is the primary objective of the regulation and that's to ensure that all biocidal products in Europe are evaluated and authorized to the same principles. So the active substances are actually evaluated at an EU level and then entered onto what we call a positive union list if they're considered to be safe for the use that's been proposed for them. Formulators are then able to use these active substances in their products and the products are authorised at the national level. So you can only apply for a regulation, a BPR authorisation um, once the active substance is on the union list for the appropriate product type. For other active substances that are still in what we call the review programme, the old existing national rules on product registration apply right up until the point of inclusion in the union list and these are what we call the transitional arrangements. So you might find that you will have a combination of old national registrations and a new biocidal products regulation authorisation applying for exactly the same product but it just depends on what the use is, which type of registration you have. Once the BPR takes over, you'll have to have a valid authorization for each country you want to actually sell the product in. So for multiple countries, we use a process called mutual recognition. And this is where you would initially apply in one country, for example, you can do that in the UK. They evaluate your product and they decide if it's safe to be used in accordance with the use conditions that you put on your label. If you then also want to sell in France, you ask for mutual recognition of the UK authorization. And in this case, the French competent authority considers the approval already given. And if they agree with it, then you can get an authorization in France. You can do mutual recognition in parallel, where the first evaluation and the mutual recognition are all done at the same time. Or you can do it in series. And in this case, you wait for the evaluation to be completed, and then you request mutual recognition afterwards. You still have to pay a fee for each application, but the fee for mutual recognition is normally the much lower than for your first or your lead evaluation. I'm going to talk about the data requirements that you need for an authorization later, but here I just wanted to give you an idea of what the time scale is for putting together an application and then for the authority to actually evaluate it. If you already have a product on the market and wish to keep it on that market during the transition from the old existing national rules to the new BPR authorization, then you have to have submitted your BPR application for authorization by the date of the active substance approval. And this date is published in what we call the active substance inclusion regulation and these can all be found on the ECHO website. What it does mean is that from the date of publication of an inclusion decision to the date of the approval, you may only have about 18 months or less, depending on some of the actors involved, to actually get your product tested, your dossier written, and then submitted to ECHA. Okay, some of you will already have heard about union authorization. Um, this is new to the BPR and it's an application that's being organized via ECHA. One union authorization allows you to place your product or products in the case of a product family directly onto the market of every country simultaneously. 
Union authorization is actually being brought in stepwise and it only applies where you have a similarity of use across your product types. And this is why certain product types have actually been excluded from being allowed to have union authorization. Because you have to make a pre-submission check with ECHA, you need to at least start your application six months before the active substance approval date. Your evaluation is still undertaken by one member state, but then this is sent back to ECHA for a written decision on approval. And so consequently, the evaluation period is much longer than for a national authorization, and you pay fees to both the evaluating member state and to ECHA. The other new type of authorization that's been introduced is the simplified authorization process. And it replaces what we had under the old directive as low risk products. You do have reduced data requirements for simplified authorization. It has a quick evaluation period and a much lower fee. Once the product is authorized in one member state, you only need a brief notification before you can put the product on the market in another country. You do have to note, though, that the eligibility criteria are quite stringent, and I've listed them on the slide for you. And it's critical for people to know that even under this scheme, you still have to prove that your product is efficacious for the proposed use. Same product authorization may be familiar already to some of you as the Me Too application. And in other words, it is the same product as one already authorized, except that it will probably have a different product name. To make an application, you'll need the agreement of the original authorization holder to link to their first approval. However, after you get authorization, the two applications are considered to be really independent of each other. And this gives the holder of the same product authorization considerable flexibility without having the initial cost burden of obtaining the standard authorization. Changes to the same product regulation are now underway, and this will actually allow the same product application to be made for a single or subgroup of products in a family, and even for a specific market, rather than having to mirror the original authorization that was made. So Annex 3 of the regulation lays out the requirements for a dossier for a biocidal product. And the data requirements essentially comprise of two parts. So first you have the tests on your product, which show what it is, its intrinsic hazards, that it works as you state on the label, and it will still work after two years of sitting on the shelf. The other part is a risk assessment that shows your product will be safe to humans and the environment under the conditions that you state on your label. Now, for the majority of formulators, you'll actually be looking at performing physicochemical measurements, and these include a two-year ambient storage stability test, including product characterization tests, development of analytical methods, and of course, your efficacy studies. And these are all items that will probably be individual to your product. However, if you know of others who make a similar product, you could investigate cost-sharing strategies with them. In vivo, toxicity tests should not be performed on biocidal products, and you should determine your toxicity using CLP calculation methods or you can use validated in vitro methods. But before you do any testing, check with your evaluating competent authority first. You need to remember that for every endpoint in Annex 3, you must address it in your dossier, even if you want to waive it as not being relevant to your product. So I'm going now to something that um, most people are interested in, and this is the so-called Article 95 status. So no matter what type of product you make or what sort of authorization you want, every product must contain active substance supplied by an approved supplier, and this is the so-called Article 95 listing. 
Unlike other chemical regulations, the old directive actually focused on just listing active substances regardless of the identity of the applicant that was supporting it through the inclusion process. And so we had something called the free rider concept being brought about. So if an active substance was listed in the review program for a certain product type, there was no restriction at all on who could sell the substance in the EU, even though only a few companies were actively paying to keep these substances on the market. What Article 95 aims to do is to level the playing field by making these free riders either join the existing participants and pay a share of the cost, or by removing them from the EU market altogether. It's now up to formulators to ensure that any active substance that they use is sourced from a company listed in Article 95, not only for that substance, but also for the appropriate product type. For those of you who are interested in in situ generated substances, you need to obtain precursors, and that's those not identified as basic substances from the listed suppliers. You should have actually been in compliance since the 1st of September. There is no phase out period, so legally you cannot sell products made with an active from an unapproved supplier and your customers should not use up stocks of product containing active from unapproved sources. A grace period has been suggested by the Commission. It's only a suggestion and it's not legally binding on Member States. So make sure that you comply as quickly as possible as Member States have to report back to the Commission to show that they are actively enforcing this requirement. You also need to check whether you need technical equivalence for your supply. If technical equivalence is necessary and your supplier will not provide the ECHA reference number to show that technical equivalence has been done, then you will need to do this application yourself and that has to be done before you can submit any application for authorization. I now come to the subject of treated articles, which affects many manufacturers, even if they're not selling something that serves a biocidal function. The definition of a treated article ensures that most articles on sale in the EU could be classed as a treated article. And this has actually made compliance with this part of the regulation complex. Not only do you need to determine whether you have a treated article or biocidal product, but then if it is a treated article, do you need to put labelling on it? Do you need to generate efficacy data? And also you need to decide if the use is covered by the active substance approval decision. Unlike REACH, there is no borderline concentration below which the requirements are no longer applicable. But it was recognised that if you have a long manufacturing process with multiple intermediate treated articles, for example with a car, it's not possible for the finished product supplier to specify exactly what biocidal products and active substances have been used and how much would still remain. It's therefore the responsibility of the person placing the biocidal product or the active into an article, mixture or substance to comply appropriately. The most often asked question is whether something is a treated article or is it a biocidal product. And there is guidance that has been developed to try and help with this determination and I've provided the reference on the slide. The process decision, the decision process works on a flowchart system with the first question being why is the active substance or the biocidal product being added to the article? So if the biocide is to protect the article itself, for example, to prevent UV deterioration or microbial decay, then in this case, it would be considered to be a treated article. However, if the article was treated to have an external antimicrobial effect, for example, if you want it to maintain a disinfected surface, then this is actually a biocidal function, and the article then could be considered to be a biocidal product. If you potentially have a biocidal product, you then need to decide if the treated article has a primary biocidal function. And a primary biocidal function is interpreted as being a function of first rank importance or value compared to all the other functions of the treated article. 
This will need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis, but there are several criteria given in the guidance to try and help you make a decision. For instance, what is the use and purpose of the treated article and what claims are being made? And is your use similar to or the same as a comparable biocidal product? Ultimately, you may need to have a definitive decision on whether it's a treated article that is subject to biocidal product authorization, and this is normally done via an Article 3.3 request from a member state to the EU Commission and other member states. If you find that you do have a treated article that has a biocidal function, you still have to show that the product that's contained in that treated article is efficacious. And although there is some guidance on determination of efficacy of biocidal products, you might find that it's not actually appropriate for a treated article, so you will need to investigate further on the most appropriate method. If the use of the active substance in a treated article wasn't considered, during active substance evaluation. This will also have to be addressed. And if an application for the use of the active in a treated article is not under examination, or an application has not been submitted by the 1st of September 2016, then the treated article must be removed from the market by the 1st of March 2017, and this is under Article 95 of the regulation. I'm just going to give you a quick note on the wording that's used in the regulation in, re in um, relation to treated articles because the BPR does make a distinction between what we say called placing on the market which is actually the first making available on the market and making available on the market which is any supply. It's been pointed out that the regulation requirements for treated articles only cover placing on the market. And this means that national rules will actually apply when making treated articles available on the market, and these rules will not be harmonized. So suppliers of treated articles need to make sure that they comply with any national rules that may be introduced because of this, in addition to compliance with the BPR. So although labelling of treated articles has been mandatory since the 1st of September 2013, there have been lots of practical difficulties in actually determining how these labelling requirements should be applied, and especially as there are several other regulatory schemes that could also apply to your finished product. So the BPR itself specifies that if there is a biocidal claim or release of the active substance from the treated article, you must on the label identify what the active substance is, what the biocidal property is, and what the use instructions are. However, some of the information specified as mandatory for the label will not actually be available to those active substances and products that have not yet gone through the full BPR evaluation process. So in new guidance that we now have, the labelling is split into two different categories. The first is general labelling, and this relates to the standard instructions for use and the use precautions to be taken if there are any that apply. And the second is specific labelling, and this relates to information coming out of the active substance approval decision, in particular if there is a non-approval decision for the active substance which is actually relevant to the treated article. I've done a quick slide on master batches as they are a prime example of how the treated article guidance is applied in practice. So over the last two years there have been major discussions on whether master batches should be considered as biocidal products or not. A guidance document was finally published in September of this year and master batches are described in there as being a carrier system for the transfer of properties into a finished product. So using this description, it's been determined that if your master batch um, is used to confer a relevant biocidal property to an article or mixture so that that property is available to the end user, for example, if you want to confer an antimicrobial property to a surface, a kitchen surface or a chopping board, then this is a biocidal product. 
But if your master batch is used as an intermediate and it's supplied without the intent of exerting a biocidal function in the form which it is supplied to the user, then it's not considered to be a biocidal product. So if this decision actually affects you um, and you need to do something about authorising um, a master batch, the Commission is actually um, promoting the use of biocidal product family authorisation as a way of helping um, applicants reduce cost and stopping duplication of effort. So what is a biocidal product family? So a product family is a group of products being similar in their composition, their uses and their levels of risk and efficacy. And the concept is based around a risk envelope approach. So if your product with the highest level of hazard is assessed for risk and found to be safe for use, then other products with a lower hazard must also similarly be safe for that same use. For a biocidal product family application, you have one application or authorization for a single family. And this means that you only have one set of fees and one dossier. The other benefit to this is that after the family is authorised, you can then add a new product to the family by notification and 30 days later, if there are no objections, you can actually start to market that product. This makes family authorisation a very attractive proposition, um, especially to those producers in generic markets that have relatively low profit margins. These producers also have a chance to pull together in consortia to get their products authorised, something that they may not actually be able to do by themselves, and I'll come to this later. So by expanding the possibilities of what products could actually be grouped together in a family and the potential use by consortia with large numbers of members, it was then recognised that we needed some form of harmonised organisation of a family. And so the concept of what we call a meta-SPC, so an SPC is a summary of product characteristics, was introduced. These meta-SPC are subgroups of a family. So you can subgroup by composition, by use, by level of risk as defined by the hazard and the associated risk mitigation measures. Efficacy, or as in most cases, by a combination of all of these factors. As each meta SPC complies with the overall family specification, there is a potential for testing on one product in either the family or a meta SPC and then reading across to all the others within that group. As is often the case, um, dosing and application processes of a product tend to be the same regardless in of which product type you're actually using it in. And this tends to be particularly true of disinfectant and preservative products. So under these circumstances, applicants may actually want to try and include all of their users in all of their product types within their one dossier to reduce duplication of effort and also duplication of risk assessment. There is no restriction on you actually doing this, but you need to be aware that if an active substance is not yet approved for one of your product types and you put it into your authorization application, this use will not be evaluated or authorization given until such time as the active substance is included in the union list for that product type. So as I've shown you, there are many obligations but the regulation makes no concession to small and medium-sized enterprises trying to comply with these. And the Commission and ECHA have actually recognised that the burden of compliance is extremely high and some measures have been taken to try and ease these obligations for SMEs. Most obviously, there is a reduction in the fees that have to be made to ECHA and also a few member states have reduced their fees that this may only comprise a small part of your total actual fee. We also have some guidance on data sharing and cost compensation, but as cost compensation is normally carried out between the data owner and the purchaser, there is no legal requirement to actually reduce a cost for an SME in this case. So a new 
a couple of new concepts have been introduced to try and make it easier and cheaper to obtain an authorization and we're just looking at how these are working out now. So we've seen how product families can be used to get lots of different products into one authorization application. By then allowing consortia to apply for a family authorization, you now have an opportunity for companies to come together, put their products together in one family, and then share all the costs and obligations between them. By taking this one step further, the changes to the same product regulation mean that applicants can now additionally ask for a same product authorization to only one product or a specific meta SPC in a family or for a certain single market which gives you even greater flexibility and cost reductions. So for many SME a consortium is probably going to be the best option for maintaining a place on the market. It's also worth understanding that you may, by joining a consortium, have to make concessions or take some risks by being within that group, especially if you're having to work with some of your competitors. If a consortium is set up correctly, the potential risk should actually be minimal in comparison to the benefits it can bring. And I've tried to give you the potential benefits and drawbacks on being within a consortium in the slide. But when you start making this type of decision, you need to really make sure you understand exactly what rights you have, how the money is being spent, and what support will be extended in the future, particularly a renewal if comparative assessment is going to be a possibility. Authorization obligations do not end once the approval is given. And throughout the approval period, you will still need to be actively maintaining records on your production and amending your authorization as new information, including changes to CLP of the products occurs. Approvals only last a maximum of 10 years and 7 years if the active substance is a candidate for substitution. And you also have to actually apply for renewal at least 550 days before your authorization runs out. Okay, so finally a quick word on two unrelated topics, in situ generated substances and comparative assessments. And I'm taking in situ generated substances first. So for those of you unfamiliar, unfamiliar with this, an in situ active substance is a substance produced at the point of use and that's normally from a precursor or combination of precursors that in themselves have no intrinsic biocidal property. Often you may need a special generator to initiate a chemical reaction which actually results in the formation of the active molecule. So under the directive it was really unclear if this type of substance should be evaluated. So what we found was some substances were supported whilst others remained outside of scope. With the introduction of the regulations, the situation was clarified with in situ generation now added into the definition of a biocidal product. And this has resulted in the Commission having to publish guidance to show which systems are already in the review programme and those which have been identified as now still being in use but are not in the review, so these require notification. The guidance also tries to define which precursor, if any, should be included in Article 95 so that anyone using the generation system can purchase from an approved supplier. Essentially, if you supply either the equipment to make an in situ substance or a substance that can be used to make an in situ active substance being used for a biocidal purpose, then you need to check what your obligations are under the regulation and whether you need to be actually making steps to notify the generation system by April 2016. If your system is not notified and supported for inclusion in the review program by next September, then you will have to stop use and move to a system which is being supported. So I've left comparative assessment right until last because hopefully very few of you will have to go through this process. Comparative assessment will apply to products that contain active substances that have been identified as candidates for substitution or they meet the exclusion criteria but they still are needed on the European market. 
The assessment is normally done at product renewal and products containing candidates for substitution are compared against other products authorised for the same use and also against non-chemical or physical alternatives. And this is in terms of risk assessment, hazard, efficacy and resistance profiles and also socio-economic factors. If it's found that there are alternatives available that provide the same or greater levels of protection with a lower risk and without socio-economic detriment, then those products containing the candidate for substitution will be removed from the market. For those of you formulating products, you need to be aware of the status of your active substance and you have to decide if you can reformulate to remove any possibility of being caught in this procedure and that has to be done prior to be making any application for authorization. Once you have made your application for authorization you cannot change the active substance in your product and you cannot in a product family include products where the active substance concentration is zero. I've given you a reference to the guidance on this topic, but this guidance is going to be tested by one member state first, so it will be subject to change. And so to really end, I've tried to give you all the links to the relevant pieces of guidance and the websites where you can find information on the different topics that I mentioned throughout the presentation. Some of the guidance is the old guidance that relates back to the direct principles under the directive. So you need to be careful on how you use this and you need to watch out for the new guidance as it's gradually introduced under the regulation. Thank you. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarah. I think that was uh, very uh, thorough. We do have a few questions, so we've got a couple of questions that were submitted before the um, uh, webinar and a couple that have come up through uh, through the course of the presentation. So I'll just go through those uh, one at a time. So the first question is about registration timescales, um, and that's from Anthony Gilbert. And some of the some of his suppliers are currently registering their products, but some aren't. So he was concerned to about what the timescales are for for dealing with those. Okay, well, as I say, it, it really depends on what's happening with the active substance, whether you have um, already the active substance is being included on the union list for a certain product type, um, and whether they're looking at the old registrations or the new BPR authorization. So, um, as I say, it is very much led by the active substance um, inclusion on the union list, so people need to keep a check on those. Um, HSE are very good. They send out um, warnings about when things have had a vote for inclusion or a vote for non-inclusion and tell you and show you where to find the deadlines on the ECHO website. So what you may find, as I say, is depending on what the active substance is, some people will be having to start to make their authorization applications under the BPR now, um, and for others, um, because it's a different product type that's not yet been included, they don't have to do anything yet, and they'll probably just be looking at old national registrations. So it, it, there, there is no one set answer in that case, I'm afraid. It just really depends on you checking what's happening with the active substance. Okay. Okay, thanks, Sarah. I think that pretty much covers that one. The second one that we've got is how much data from the active dossier can we read across into formulations, particularly with reference to efficacy data, because some of that's perhaps impossible to uh, to do to, to particular standards. So how does that work? Okay, the problem that you have is that when you get a letter of access um, for making an authorization application to the active substance, you need to be careful because most active substance suppliers probably won't give you access to the efficacy data that they've used in that dossier. 
So that's one issue that you need to be aware of before you even start. The, the second issue is that the efficacy data used for the active substance evaluation tends to be what is now classed as phase one in the new efficacy guidance and all they have to do is prove that the active substance has a biocidal effect on the typical organisms that are being considered within that product type. Whereas when you get to product authorization, what they are looking for is what we now call phase two testing. And these are where you actually have to show that your product is efficacious to a certain standard and it could be within a set um, time limit um, and to a set level um, and to a certain set of organisms. Now what we tend to have is um, particularly if you look at the disinfectants is you will find that there are mandatory organisms that you have to look at which tend to be the bacteria and then depending on your use you will have optional organisms as well and you have different specified test methods that you will have to use and uh, say meet the different standards and what you have in the active substance dossier is not sufficient to meet those criteria that you are expected to match in the product authorization so it is really difficult um, so in that case you can't read across easily and you are probably going to be expected to generate your own efficacy data. There was also a question about GLP. Now the authorities know that GLP probably doesn't apply to most of the efficacy that you will be looking at but in that case what you need to be looking at is some sort of approval system like the ISO approval system and that's also accepted. But again you need to be careful, check that your lab that you are going to look at is validated for the methods that you are interested in and also what sort of quality standard they're working to. And if you are in doubt, check back with your, your competent authority that you're going to be making your application to and they should be able to provide you some assistance. Okay. Brilliant. Well, I think that covers that one pretty well, Sarah. Thanks very much for that. Um, the third question is from Amalia Costara, and she's, uh, uh, or he, I don't actually know, sorry, apologies to, for that. So they're asking, uh, how could a public, public health inspector ensure compliance of a downstream user? What kind of label information would they be expected to be seeing um, in that kind of situation? Okay, um, so it's, it's difficult because we're now looking at enforcement and enforcement um, is different within each country. Um, but essentially what somebody is going to be looking for is that um, if we're talking about an authorised product, so it's been authorised under the BPR, you'll be looking at finding the name of the active substance on the label, looking at the use instructions. You will also be looking for the authorization number so that they can check back with the ECHO website to make sure it's authorized for the appropriate use. And they will also be looking at the claims matrix. Now this will be, you will probably have on the label um, you will have to put what you are effective against and how long for and these are the use instructions so again the public health inspector will know exactly um, how long something needs to be applied for and what organisms need to have been tested for the use that is being um, for the use it's, it's being used in. So if, if it's a hospital setting, there are specific requirements for hospitals and there are certain contact times that are required for hospitals. 
So that's that's the sort of information that they'll be looking to see on that label and making sure that those people using it are complying with those use instructions. But I say it, it is difficult because enforcement and checks do vary from member state to member state. Okay. Okay, great. So now we've got uh, some. We've got a few questions around uh, the testing that we need to do, particularly in stability, uh, and a couple of other things. So we've got questions from Mark Spurlock and Alex Francis about the stability package. Uh, so Mark's asking. He 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 was understood that there was scope for doing accelerated studies, for example, short uh, times like two weeks at 54 degrees Celsius. Celsius, if I can speak properly, to support a two-year shelf life, and a related question from Alex: uh, What sort of typical stability protocols would be used, sort of for numbers of samples and conditions and time points? So I think it's, that's those are related about the about generating stability data. Okay, right. So you'd be looking at using um, in the main the CPAC um, methods for storage stability and these were originally um, produced for pesticide market. Um, there is quite a lot of information on these on the HSE website for those of you that might have actually been involved in COPR. Previously you will be aware of the storage stability tests and the different product characterization tests and FISCAM endpoints that you need to be looking at under there. There are two methods, there is an accelerated and there is an ambient storage stability. The ambient is a mandatory requirement and you have to have an ambient storage stability study. Now it doesn't have to be two years, it depends upon your product. You may know already that your product is not going to be stable for two years. Um, and in which case you would already be in discussion with your member state telling them what you're looking at and how long it will be. So you will only be able to claim a shelf life that is based on the ambient storage stability study in the end. You can use accelerated data um, to start off with if you don't have the full ambient um, data, but the accelerated will only give you a provisional self shelf life. Um, it, it's good also, accelerated is also quite good to use if you're looking at product families and you only want to run an ambient study on one of your product family, you can use accelerated to support read across just to one product um, on the ambient. So, so again, yes you can use accelerated but don't expect. Um, it, your product authorization to be um, granted just on terms of the accelerated, you do have to have the ambient in the end. Um, the number of um, times that you would need um, to actually check your active substance concentration and also if you have substance of concern in the product you will also be, have to be checking the concentrations of those throughout your stability study. That really does depend again on how your own knowledge of the product, how you how stable you know it is, but you normally would be looking at something like three months, six months, twelve months, eighteen months, two years. So as I say again, perhaps if you have accelerated data that will guide you in what you need to be looking at the ambient storage stability. And you also need to make sure that you have fully validated analytical methods to determine both active substance concentration and the substances of concern in that product um, when you actually start the st studies. Okay, there's quite a lot there. Tell me if I missed yes. something. <laughs> No, I think I think I think that that covers most of that. There is a related question again from Alex Francis, which was uh, in talking about degradation products. In uh, if you're if I think this is over the course of the um, stability testing. If the degradation products, if the active substance hasn't decreased decreased beyond the threshold, do you still need to submit uh, degradation products information? 
Um, it, it depends on what the degradation products are and say again if you know that the degradation product could be classed as a substance of concern then you would probably have to check that over the course of the stability study even if your active substance concentration didn't change okay so that that's probably um, one issue again where you would need to come back to the authority and they would tell you what they would expect to see. Okay. Okay. Um, so one more related question from Mark uh, was the um, was he's talking about you using he's proposing to generate in vitro data to support product efficacy rather than in vivo studies with cats and dogs. I think this is something that you touched on briefly. Um, uh, in the presentation, yeah. but uh, in the spirit of the three R's, the reduction and uh, whatever, would would you expect that kind of data to be acceptable? Um, the problem is, it's the the problem is that the efficacy guidance hasn't been fully developed yet, um, and there is an issue when we start getting into actually testing on the animals just for efficacy. Um, we've already seen with the rodenticides that you have to actually test on the rats. You have to have field trials with the rats themselves. So in that respect, again you would be talking to your member state but they would probably be expecting to see some sort of field trial to show that your product really does work against the organism that you're trying to control okay right thanks Sarah so we've got a couple more questions uh, one from Andrea Mauro who says uh, can two similar products used in different uh, product types be part of the same family? Yes, they can. They can. Excellent. Yeah. And if uh, yes, so does it mean it, that it, they it, can be marketed for the same use for the both uses? Um, if if you have your product, it depends on how you set up your product family, and it depends on how you do your risk assessment. If you want to use them both for the same uses, then you would have to do risk assessment for both uses on on the products on both sorts of products. Okay, um, and again, sorry, just coming back to the different product types, it would depend again on the similarity of use. So um, you probably wouldn't be able to put an antifoulant in with a rodent, um, not a rodenticide, an insecticide. Um, so, so again, it, it comes back to the similarity of use. Um, you need to consider that the way you're using the products would be very similar even across those product types. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. So we've got just a couple more questions. One from Stuart Charters. He says, if a supplier is not on Article 95, can they still be used but for products that aren't going to be marketed in the EU? Yes, but you have to make sure that they those products never go into the EU. So you would have to make sure that they are exported. Um, straight away it, yeah it's 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 article 95 is about products that are placed on the EU market so yes you can use um, a non a non EU approved supplier for anything that is going to be immediately exported right that's great and the last one that we've got on our list over here at the moment unless you know there's still some time for all of you there, if you if you still have a question that we haven't uh, addressed, then do please type it in in the questions box. But for the moment, the last question that we have down is from Jim Tarbottom, uh, and that's quite a specific one. It's for on-site generation of sodium hypochlorite from salt and water for use at a water treatment works to treat drinking water, which is not to sell. Would that still, do you think, need uh, a BPR registration? Um, it, it, it should be, if, if I know the system that he's actually talking about, that should actually be already covered. It might be the product type 
that hasn't been um, supported and if the product type hasn't been supported for that system then yes he would need he would be within the remit of the BPR so you need to check but in that case that system is already being supported by quite a few people so you would need to check back with them what they're actually doing and whether product type 5 was going to be included at a later date. Okay. Okay, well thank you very much Sarah. I think you've answered most of the questions there that we have in our list. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and joining the webinar and being so attentive throughout the, uh, the talk that we've had. Um, you may now see that uh, in the handouts part of your dashboard, your GoToWebinar dashboard, you should see uh, the slide deck uh, appearing there that you can uh, refer back to and uh, download if you'd like to. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, so the only thing that sort of rem uh, remains for me to say is to thank Sarah very much. Uh, and I'm sure if there are more questions coming through. Uh, if, if anything occurs to you, then do get in touch with Chemistry World webinars, and we may be able to uh, to sort out some contact for you. Um, I'd like to say that uh, we do have more webinars coming up. So next week, on the 8th of November, uh, we have a webinar with Perkin Elmer, which is about uh, chemical data analysis using TIBCO Spotfire. That's with an expert from Perkin Elmer and uh, one of their customers from uh, a company that's actually using the software. Uh, and please do do check the Chemistry World website uh, regularly to see what other webinars are coming up. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening and say goodbye, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>